your mother Green Lady, we're covering today's Top Box News. Okay, we'll start with this. We now know who it is Sky Nicholson is going to be fighting on the undercard of Jock Bravis versus Liam Barrow. She's going to be taking on Christina Jacobs, who sports a professional record of six wins with three losses, no draws, no knockouts, having been stopped at least once. The Sky Nicholson sports an unblemished record of four wins, no losses, and no draws with no knockouts, none recorded. This is intended to be Matt Shroom's maiden voyage. Their endeavor into the Australian boxing scene, that market, that's going to be a very busy day in Australian boxing and a busy day in boxing overall. That same day, Devin Haney and George Kambosos are supposed to be boxing each other for the second time in Australia, no less. That's supposed to be going down on Sunday in Australia, Saturday in America. Due to the 14 or 15 hour time zone difference between Australia and the United States. It'll be happening on Sunday in their time, Saturday night, here in this part of the world. According to Eddie Hearn, they are heading for a sellout in Brisbane. Virtually the entire floor sold out and other categories limited. Going to be some atmosphere in South Bank, Bado Jarvis. And what is a battle of the unbeatens? Unbeaten Liam Bado, unbeaten Jock Bravis. On the undercard, we're going to see unbeaten Dempsey McKean and unbeaten Sky Nicholson. She's going to be taking on Christina Jacobs. Christina, who was last in action in June of this year, she's actually fought two times this year, two times last year. So she's been busy. She ain't got no ring rust or cobwebs she needs to shake off. You'll notice she lost a split decision to Corey Faw. Got stopped by Rebecca Hawker. Dropped a unanimous decision to Carly Salmon. So while this is a fight with a winning record, winning record on paper, so to speak. It's still a developmental fight. It's intended to be a manageable situation for young unbeaten Sky Nicholson. Sky debuted as a professional in March of this year. She's already fought four times. She's had four fights already this year. This will be her fifth. Young Sky Nicholson, who's a southpaw, a pure boxer who likes to stick and move and stay on the outside. Economic and defensively responsible. Fast hands, fast feet, athletic, not an artillery fighter, and not a power puncher. A power and brute force are not Sky Nicholson's calling cards. She's going to be taken on Christina Jacobs. And having had a look at Christina, I can already see Sky landing straight shots comfortably from the outside as she navigates the ring, uses those legs to move around, make herself a moving target, keep herself a moving target. You know, Christina Jacobs, she stands very static, very upright. That torso doesn't move much. She doesn't seem to bend at the waist or bend at the knees, doesn't come in at a slight crouch. She's essentially there to be hit. And because Sky Nicholson has such long levers, long legs, long arms, she'll be able to tag Christina Jacobs quite comfortably from the outside and cruise to a points decision. This is a very winnable fight for Sky Nicholson. It's very winnable because Christina Jacobs can't match Sky's hand speed, her foot speed, or her ability to maneuver and tack on that Sky is a southpaw. She leads with her right hand. We know how tricky those southpaws can be. Sky's a southpaw and Christina's an orthodox fighter. That's just going to make it even harder for Christina to get within range of Sky to land shots, to land punches. Of course, Sky's going to be moving to her right, staying just on the outside of Christina's lead hand, her left hand. As stated, she'll be able to tag Christina comfortably from the outside. Christina, who doesn't have the fastest hands, doesn't have the fastest feet, isn't the most prolific puncher. She doesn't seem to have much of a work rate. It's really just one or two punches at a time as she attempts to close the gap, which I think she'll find quite difficult against Sky Nicholson. Sky on points is the logical pick. She'll be too fast and too sharp for Christina. She won't give Christina Christina, very many, if any, opportunities to land much of anything. It's the pure boxer's calling card, being defensively responsible and economic whilst doing so, boxing from the outside. And Christina, she just ain't got the work rate for a fight like this. The work rate or the foot speed. In order to make the pure boxer uncomfortable, you have to throw punches in bunches. You have to take chances. Well, not just take chances. You have to be able to keep up. You have to be able to, and I don't think Christina can. Sky on points is the way to go. This is a manageable situation. Another developmental fight, which I take no issue with because Sky Nicholson only has four professional fights. She needs these rounds. It's been a very productive year for Sky. She debuted this year, and by the end of it, she will have fought. She will have fought at least five times. 
before this year is out. And if she makes short work of Christina Jacobs, she might be able to squeeze in a sixth fight. She might. In other news, I'm sure that most of you have heard by now that Floyd has set to stage yet another exhibition match in the Land of the Rising Sun towards the end of this month in the Saitama Super Arena against Mikuru Asakura. We talked about that exhibition match in passing, though what's making headlines now is that Floyd is already looking to schedule yet another exhibition match before this year is out with social media influencer Deji, the younger brother of KSI. Deji, who was very recently an action on the undercard of KSI's last show, The Misfits Pay-Per-View, which took place on the DAZN platform, a pay-per-view that was reportedly quite successful and drew out the stars. Some familiar faces from the sport of boxing. We know Chris Eubank Jr. was there. He was carrying a bucket of chicken. He caught a lot of people's attention since he has a rather rigorous weight cut ahead of him, ahead of this upcoming Conor Ben fight. IBF flyweight champion Sonny Edwards was there. Derek Chisaria was there along with many other familiar fighters, many other familiar faces. I believe that this is what Floyd is looking to tap into, the exhibition match that he had earlier this year with his old sparring partner, Don Moore. It flew largely under the radar because Don Moore, nobody knows that guy except for Floyd, who used to spar him. I mean, yeah, maybe somebody paid Floyd some money to do that thing, but overall, it didn't really get people's attention, especially not in this part of the world. This might. Floyd Mayweather is reportedly now in talks to face Deji, KSI's brother, in an exhibition fight on November 13th in Dubai. Mayweather is set to face Mikuru Asakura in Japan on September 25th and previously said that another bout is possible this year. Deji is a more well-known guy, I'd say, than dangerous Don Moore. He's a social media influencer, the same as his brother. I'm a little bit surprised. Surprised that after Logan Paul accused Floyd Mayweather of not paying him for their exhibition match last year, that any social media influencer would want anything to do with Floyd Mayweather, who I'd say is quite shamelessly pursuing these exhibition matches with these influencers to siphon off funds from their fans, since no serious boxing fan, no serious connoisseur of the sport is interested in watching Floyd waltz around the ring with novices and amateurs. And there's nothing unethical about what Floyd is doing, you understand, but you also have to understand who these events are geared towards. They're not necessarily geared towards boxing fans who want to see boxing matches. You go to Japan for a Mikiru Asakura exhibition match and you're relying on Asakura's audience to pay to be there, pay to show up and pay per view. You're relying on them. You're not relying on boxing fans here stateside because boxing fans here stateside, they don't know who that guy is. And they're not gonna pay per view to see you waltz around the ring with him because it's not a real fight and he's not a real pugilist. He's a kickboxer. These exhibition matches with a Mikiru Asakura or a Deji are not necessarily being marketed towards your serious fight fan that wants to see serious fights. Yeah, we're not the audience for these things. They're selling these things to somebody else. You go to Japan for Mikiru Asakura because because people know him over there. You do an exhibition match with a Deji because, well, he's a social media influencer. You think about the respective markets that these exhibitions are being marketed towards and you realize that this ain't for a boxing fan per se. No, it's not for guys like me and you. Guys like me and you don't want to see this, don't want to pay for it. But someone else might. I defer you to Gareth Davies' tweet post-fight after the KSI Misfit show, per sources, the Zone Group event had 445,000 buys on August 27th at the O2. You see that? 445,000 buys, close to half a million for that KSI show. Close to half a million pay-per-views sold. Granted that these are moderately priced pay-per-views. The price point is not akin to what you'd pay for a Canelo Alvarez fight, though all the same. There is money to be made from these things, and the audience that consumes it it's not your traditional boxing fan that wants to see a traditional boxing match, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an audience for it. There is. And it's that audience that Floyd hopes to tap into and thereby capitalize on. It would have to be because Floyd's audience, the audience that he amassed over the years when he was an active fighter, well, they watched him because he was fighting other active fighters, other real pugilists in other real fights. Whereas here today, 
now that he's retired, a serious boxing fan, serious boxing fan that wants to see a serious fight, they're not going to spend their hard-earned dollars to watch him waltz around the ring with a novice or a rank amateur. Of course not. Manny Pacquiao is supposed to be having an exhibition match of his own. The underlying principle here is that the man opposite the ring of Floyd Mayweather or the man opposite the ring of a Manny Pacquiao has a big enough audience that that pugilist, that seasoned fighter, can make some money in a relatively safe situation against a novice boxer, a novice pugilist. That's the underlying principle, more or less. And while that doesn't appeal to guys like me and you... It might not, but there's still money to be made, and that's the point. That's why Floyd's doing it. It's why Manny Pacquiao's doing it. It is rather alarming the rate at which Floyd Mayweather is scheduling these exhibition matches. He is scheduling more of these kinds of things than anybody else out there. If you think about it, Floyd has kept a more regular schedule of exhibition matches than some active boxers have kept. Think about it. Jermall Charlo hasn't even fought this year. Or Terrence Crawford. Keith Thurman's only had one fight. Jermall Charlo has only had one fight. When you think about the rate at which Floyd is scheduling these exhibitions he's been putting on, he will have had at least three of them this year alone. He's getting out there more often than some active boxers. And the rate at which he's scheduling these things, it leads a lot of people to believe that, I don't know, has this guy got money troubles or something? He might. He's doing these things one after the other. There's nothing wrong with that, but he does seem to be scheduling these things quite often. He hasn't even shared the ring with Asakura yet, and he's already scheduling the next exhibition match. So like I said, there's nothing wrong with it, but the frequency of these bouts is indicative of something. If they get this Deji fight over the line... Floyd will have fought more times this year than Jake Paul. He's fight more often than social media influencers. He's fight more often than active boxers. You do the math. Finally, in men's heavyweight news, Deontay Wilder had this to say about his rival, Anthony Joshua. He says, they made Anthony Joshua. They made him. We're born to do it, not made. Even the Olympics, they gave him that medal. They bought him a lot of the belts. Deontay Wilder has a distorted view of himself and others and the surrounding world around him. That's what he has. He continued, the way they moved him and prepared him for certain moments, he was not ready for it. And he said this on Brian Custer's Last Stand podcast, going down memory lane, back to when Anthony Joshua won that gold medal. Why didn't A Twitter user that goes by the name Scarlett Michanko said it best. Why didn't Wilder win the medal? Oh, he got knocked out. Deontay Wilder is still unwilling to accept the realities about himself, his own career, and the circumstances of his loss, his losses to Tyson Fury. He's unwilling to accept the reality about a lot of things. When he says that Anthony Joshua bought the belts, quote unquote bought the belts, that's far from the truth. It's that Anthony Joshua already had a certain level of celebrity. He was already a box office draw, so much so he was able to incentivize offers to champions. Oh. Forget that Charles Martin was a PBC fighter on the PBC side of things. Did Wilder and his team make any attempt to get either Charles Martin or Joseph Parker in the ring? Wasn't Deontay the guy that used to say, one face, one name, one champion? What happened to all of that? It was a gimmick. In hindsight, he never actually lifted a fucking finger to unify this division. Perhaps this is why he resents Anthony Joshua, still resents Tyson Fury as well, saying, I stand by everything. It's crazy and sad that business had to be conducted in certain manners to quote unquote rob a person from his greatness, but in reality, it only made that greatness higher. Explain to me how getting your ass kicked by Tyson Fury two times made you great or made you greater. Deontay Wilder needs to make himself out to be a victim of some kind in order to escape the reality of things that Tyson Fury only ever got a title shot because you voluntarily gave him one and you voluntarily gave him one because you couldn't have your way with Anthony Joshua all those different offers that Anthony Joshua made him because he made him about four or five approximately four or five offers the most famous one being the hundred million dollar guarantee from the zone hundred million 120 million an offer that Wilder admittedly rejected every time they made Deontay an offer it was worth more cash than Deontay Wilder was making at the time the initial 12.5 million dollars that they offered him 12.5 million flat 
Wilder wasn't making $12 million a fight at that time. That was substantially more than he was making. And every offer they followed up with was not only bigger than the last offer, but far bigger than anything Deontay Wilder was making fight by fight. He and his team chose to reject those offers. You can't turn around now. You see, we often take these trips down memory lane, and the moral of the story always remains the same. The conclusion. And the conclusion is that the last guy that can criticize Ant Joshua's career in any arena, in any respect, is Deontay Wilder. Where Deontay Wilder went to the Olympics and won the bronze, Anthony won the gold. Where Deontay debuted several years before Anthony Joshua as a professional boxer. Anthony, it was Anthony that brought all the energy and attention and the revenue to this division, not Wilder. Wilder was around for years and nobody noticed him. If the heavyweight division started heating up, it wasn't because of Deontay, because Deontay was around for a long time and he didn't make any waves. Tyson Fury, he did, but immediately after making waves, he retired for two and a half years. So you really can't say that he brought all this attention and all this revenue to the division when he wasn't even around. He was off somewhere getting fat and sniffing cold. The truth is that the last guy who can criticize anything about Anthony Joshua, anything at all, anything about his amateur career or his professional career. The last guy that can do that is Deontay Wilder because he's always been a step behind Anthony Joshua, even though in many ways he had a head start. He debuted before Anthony Joshua, but he never unified anything. He never tried to. And if Deontay really wanted to prove that he was better than Anthony Joshua, that Deontay's a born fighter, a born champion, whereas Anthony's a made champion. If you wanted to prove that you were better than that guy, you had the opportunity to do that, and you walked away from it every single time. These events are all well documented. Every single offer Anthony Joshua made to Deontay that Deontay Wilder spat off. Every single time. The truth is that Deontay only chose Tyson Fury over Anthony because he thought it would be easy. Tyson didn't have a reputation as a puncher in those days. The truth is that running away from a Joshua fight is what led Wilder here.